natural law constrained with legislation. Natural law, natural justice, being a principle that is naturally applicable and adequate to the rightful settlement of every possible controversy that can arise among men, being, too, the only standard by which any controversy whatever be between man and man can rightfully be settled, being a principle whose protection every man demands for himself whether he's willing to accord it to others or not, being also an immutable principle, one that is always and everywhere the same, in all ages and nations, being self-evidently necessary in all times and places, being so entirely impartial and equitable toward all, so indispensable to the peace of mankind everywhere, so vital to the safety and welfare of every human being, being too so easily learned, so generally known, and so easily maintained by such voluntary associations as all honest men can readily and rightfully form for that purpose, being such a principle as this, these questions arise. Why is it that it does not universally, or well, not universally, prevail? Why is it that it has not ages ago been established throughout the world as the only law that any or all men could rightly be compelled to obey? Why is it that any human being ever conceived that anything so self-evidently superfluous, false, absurd, and atrocious as all legislation necessarily must be could be of any use to mankind or have any place in human affairs? The answer is, that through all historic times, whenever people have advanced beyond the point of savagery and have learned to increase their means of substance by the cultivation of the soil, a greater or lesser number of them have associated and formed themselves as robbers to plunder and enslave all others who had either accumulated any property that could be seized or had shown by their labor that they could be made to contribute to the support or pleasure of those who would enslave them. These bands of robbers, small in number have at first, have increased their power by uniting with each other, inventing warlike weapons, disciplining themselves and perfecting their organizations as military forces, and dividing their plunder, including their captives, among themselves, either in such proportions as have been previously agreed on, or in such as their leaders, always desirous to increase the number of their followers, should prescribe. The success of these bands of robbers was an easy thing, for the reason that those who they plundered and enslaved were comparatively defenseless, being scattered thinly over the country, engaged wholly in trying by rude implements and heavy labor to extort substances from the soil, having no weapons of war other than sticks and stones, having no military di discipline or organization, and no means of concentrating their forces or acting in concert when suddenly attacked. Under these circumstances, the only alternative left them for saving even their lives or the lives of their families was to yield up not only the crops they had gathered and the lands they had cultivated, but themselves and their families also as slaves." Thenceforth, their fate was as slaves to cultivate for others the lands they had before cultivated for themselves. Being driven constantly to their labor, wealth slowly increased, but all went into the hands of their tyrants. These tyrants, living solely on plunder and on the labor of their slaves and applying all their energies to the seizure and of still more plunder and the enslavement of still other defenseless persons, increasing too their numbers, perfecting their organizations and multiplying their weapons of war, they extend their conquests until in order to hold what they ha have already got, it becomes necessary for them to act systematically and cooperate with each other in holding their slaves in subjection. But all this they can do only by establishing what they call a government and making what they call laws. All the great governments of the world, those now existing, as well as those that are passed away, have been of this character. They have been mere bands of robbers who have associated for the purpose of plunder, conquest, and the enslavement of their fellow men. And their laws, as they have called them, have been only such agreements as 
as they have found it necessary to enter into in order to maintain their organizations and act together in plundering and enslaving others and in securing to each his agreed share of the spoils. All these laws have had no more real obligation than have the agreements which brigands, bandits, and pirates find it necessary to enter into with each other for the more successful accomplishment of their crimes and the more peaceable division of their spoils. Thus, substantially, all the legislation of the world has had its origin in the desires of one class of persons to plunder and enslave others and hold them as property. In the process of time, the robber or slaveholding class, who had seized all the lands and held all the means of creating wealth, began to discover that the easiest mode of managing their slaves and making them profitable was not for each slaveholder to hold his specified number of slaves, as he had done before, and as he would hold so many cattle, but to give them so much liberty as would throw upon themselves, the slaves, the responsibility of their own substance, and yet compel them to sell their labor to the landholding class, their former owners, for just what the latter might choose to give them. Of course, these liberated slaves, as some have erroneously called them, having no lands or other property and no means of obtaining an independent substance, had no alternative to save themselves from starvation, but to sell themselves to their landholders in exchange for the coarsest necessities of life, not always for so much as that. Uh, these liberated slaves, as they were called, were now scarcely less slaves than there were before. Uh, their means of subsistence were perhaps even more precarious than when each had his own owner, who had an interest in preserving his life. They were liable at the caprice or interest of the landholder to be thrown out of home employment and the opportunity of even earning a subsistence by their labor. They were, therefore, in large numbers driven to the necessity of begging, stealing, or starving and became, of course, dangerous to the property and quiet of their late masters. The consequence was that these late owners found it necessary for their own safety and the safety of their property to organize themselves more perfectly as a government and make laws for keeping these dangerous people in subjection. That is, laws fixing the prices at which they should be compelled to labor and also prescribing fearful punishments, even death itself, for such thefts and trespasses as they were driven to commit as their only means of saving themselves from starvation. These laws have continued in force for hundreds and in some countries for thousands of years and are in force today in greater or less severity in nearly all countries on the globe. The purpose and effect of these laws have been to maintain in the hands of the robber or slaveholding class a monopoly of all lands and, as far as possible, of all other means of creating wealth and thus to keep the great body of laborers in such a state of poverty and dependence as would compel them to sell their labor to their tyrants for the lowest price at which life could be sustained. The result of all this, that the little wealth there is in the world, is all in the hands of a few, that is, in the hands of the law-making, slave-holding class, who are now as much slaveholders in spirit as they ever were, but who accomplish their purposes by means of the laws they make for keeping the laborers in subjection and dependence instead of each one's owning his own slaves as so many chattel. Thus, the whole business of legislation, which has now grown to such gigantic proportions, had its origin in the conspiracies which have always existed among the few for the purpose of holding the many in subjection and extorting from them their labor and all the profits of their labor. And the real motives and spirit which lie at the foundation of all legislation, notwithstanding all the pretenses and disguises by which they attempt to hide themselves, are the same today as they always have been. The whole purpose of this legislation is simply to keep one class of men in subordination and servitude to another. What then is legislation? 
It is an assumption by one man or body of men of absolute irresponsible dominion over all other men whom they can subject to their power. It is the assumption by one man or body of men of a right to subject all other men to their will and their service. It is the assumption by one man or body of men of a right to abolish outright all the natural rights and all the natural liberty of all men to make all other men their slaves and to arbitrarily dictate to all other men what they may and may not do, what they may and may not have, what they may and may not be. It is, in short, the assumption of a right to banish the principle of human rights, the principle of justice itself, from off the earth, and to set up their own personal will, pleasure, and interest in its place. All this, and nothing less, is involved in the very idea that there can be any such thing as human legislation that is obligatory upon those upon whom it is imposed.